Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast, presented exclusively on the Chop Sports Channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We are recording this on Monday, January 30th. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, we will review the entire fourth round of the FA Cup, discuss the mighty Seagulls' third win over hapless Liverpool, and call round one of Arsenal versus Manchester City. But first, Wrexham. Uh, Wrexham of, of, of Ryan Reynolds and Rob McGillahenny fame and what it means. They played this weekend and had a great, great time against Sheffield United. But the discussion all fell around. Why can't we get here in the U.S. the feeling that something like Wrexham can happen? And we're going to get to the FA Cup fourth round. There's a full rundown of the show in the description all things will happen before we get there. Let's clean house. Please, please, please rate and review the show. It means everything for the show to grow. Press it on YouTube if you're watching there. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe wherever you subscribe. And thank you to everyone who has already given a review. I have so many more, and I appreciate it so much. Thank you, everyone, especially the boys from the WhatsApp group. And if you want to be in the WhatsApp group, please let me know. And find me on our Facebook page and uh, for the Squeaky Bum Time podcast. So let us go into Wrexham. So what is Wrexham? If you're not familiar with the show, Wrexham is a team in Northern Wales in the fifth tier of English football, which is one division out of the actual professional football league. It is a semi-pro league that has increasingly, especially the National League, become more and more professional as Team owners and people who want to own sports teams find value in ready-made communities of fans who love their team, and they want to be a part of the football energy. Um, I believe that Rob McGillahenny and and Ryan Reynolds bought Wrexham for $3 million, and they've taken to the city. Uh, I believe Rob saw in, in Wrexham – Something of South Philly, something of the working man's need for sport, something in the authenticity of the feeling that the city brought him. And he and Ryan Reynolds, they convinced each other. I don't think Ryan Reynolds was into sport. They convinced each other to be into this. Why is this important and how does it uh, relate to MLS? I think that Americans are responding to the story of Wrexham because we seek and authenticity that our sports do not have. Our sports do not have. I've just been rereading The Ball is Round, and one of the things that's stark about the development of football in Europe and in England specifically is how organic it was. It was just first just a local street game from town to town, something you did once a year, and you fought and punched and kicked each other. And that rough and tumble game got applied to the creation of the in the schools in England. And they fought and they fought trying to figure out what to do with crazy young guys who just like to fight. And they created this game and slowly developed rules. And that organic feeling still permeates through these teams. So Wrexham is a team that's been in existence for over 120 years. Uh, the race course ground was a race course for horse racing and cricket and Wrexham started playing there. And this authenticity that you feel when you go to Europe or you're by an old building, or if you go to Stonehenge, or if you see the Mona Lisa, these teams and the passion the fans feel is something that cannot be bought or created with a franchise. And so um, within the argument that I read, uh, I'm going to shout out my friend Karta Kirishnar, who are we're Twitter friends. We've never spoken, but he's a host of the World Soccer Talk podcast uh, out of Florida. He's always in this sort of push and pull of how does American sport get into that community feeling? And I'm not sure we can get to it or we can get to the right stories, because when you really think about it, when you think of a team in the U.S., especially an MLS team, let's take an MLS team, for instance, it's usually a team that never existed or existed as a USL lower division team at the oldest 
may have been created in the 70s and the old NASL. And those teams, you have the Portland Thorns and and, the Minnesota uh, Union, the Loons. And it's really about a very, very rich person buying a franchise in MLS that usually comes with a stadium. And so you get this antiseptic, wow, we're going to the mall feeling versus Wrexham where it's we're buying a hundred years of feeling and a hundred years of moments and a hundred years of pain and suffering. And the suffering is part of it. I keep kidding around about city needing to suffer. Part of great fandom is great suffering. And what the MLS lacks is the suffering. (laughs) Uh, I'm sure we had a moment there with Columbus crew uh, where they kind of fans almost lost their team, but that's the terrible thing about the American franchise model is if the team goes into a state of suffering, because it's so business first, the team just disappears. Uh, The team moves. The team ceases to exist. The United States has probably had more teams fold than any country in the world because our sport is based on business first. They're not community assets, although we sell them as community assets to get people to pony up money for publicly funded stadiums. Whereas you look at the race gra- the race course ground, it's painted and taken care of by the local people in the community. They have a broken down stand that you watch the game and, and it's half fallen apart as though a bomb hit it not two weeks ago. So when we think about Wrexham and we think about the MLS, here are a couple of analogies that I that come to mind for me. It's just like, how do we capture the feeling of going into a 500-year-old cathedral versus a church that was built in 1970 for a gated community. Does that feel the same? It's still a church. There's still a priest. We're still all in there together. But does that stained glass feel real to you? Does it feel like this church matters? Have there been 5,000 weddings and 10,000 baptisms? No. Or if you went to a McDonald's, does it, it nourishes you, it's food, it's a bit of a community asset, but is it the same as the diner that's been on Route 1 for 75 years that you went after every game and a community gathers around? No, it's still food, it's still a restaurant, it's not even a high-end restaurant, but that chrome, those old seats, all that stuff matters, and I think What happens with MLS teams is they don't have that. And so when we watch Wrexham, we want that. And um, I don't know how we get there, but I hope that one day we do, because I really think it's an amazingly valuable asset that, that we should all experience. We should all want it. And hopefully our sports get that long. And it's a shame that, you know, Yankee Stadium is gone and we have a new Yankee Stadium or... Let me tell you, Red Sox fans and and Wrigley Field fans and Cubs fans, never lose your stadiums. Where it is, the space, the energy, the feeling, it matters. Don't fall for the trick. You don't need a new stadium. Redo your old stadium. All right, let us get into the, um, the FA Cup actual results here on 845 into the show. Uh, just to make sure we capture it so people can listen to it later. The results, we start with Wrexham. So Wrexham, 3-3, an amazing game at the city ground. They're playing Sheffield United that we talked about in a preview who are flying high. And um, Wrexham came out in the first half. They weren't quite at it. Maybe the energy was too much. Maybe Ryan Reynolds being there, by the way, they shot to Ryan Reynolds every five seconds. He seems genuinely to be feeling the pain of being a Wrexham supporter, but I don't know. So on to Ali McBurney scores a goal on a cross, very standard. Like the levels of football here at this level are not great, but this is what real football looks like. It's blood and thunder. It's big, strong guys. And uh, Wrexham did hang in there through the first half. They probably could have been behind, but did show the fight. The crowd was behind them. It was amazing. And this in the second half, Wrexham came out, Phil Parkinson and his crew came out and just fucking battered uh, Sheffield United. 
it was not close. If we go by the nerd stats of XG and whatever, I think like Wrexham had an XG of like three and a half. Now, I don't have the XG in front of me because the FA doesn't matter about that. But one of the things I liked about this, there was no VAR. The game just flowed. James Jones on a scrappy goal. He bundles one in. Then O'Connor bundles one in. And then Mullen on the break on 86, he flies in and scores as well. But in the meantime, Ollie Norwood drew this game level on 65. So we were tied at 2-2 after the barrage from Jones and O'Connor. Um, one of the things I think about with was um, was Tozer, I believe his name was. the um, One of the fullbacks for... Where, where, where did he, what was his position? I have to find him. Tozer, where's Tozer? Was he a full uh, center back? Tuncliffe. Tozer, their primary center back, excuse me. Ben Tozer with the amazing long throw. What a weapon. Every team should try and find a player on their team who can do a long throw. Because remember, on a throw in, you can't be offside. So you can go wherever you want. You can throw it as far as you want. Seemed like any ball in the final third. Wrexham had a chance at goal. They just threw it into the mixer. And this is very indicative. For those you don't know, this is very indicative of lower league football. Even bottom half of the Premier League used to be like this, but it's gotten much better. But you're seeing with Wrexham versus Sheffield United, real traditional English football. And it's fantastic. So leads are up. Paul Mullen brings them up. Sorry, Wrexham are up. Paul Mullen on 86 with the with the diagnosis of his kid having autism. He points to the shoe. Just incredible stuff. And Wrexham are so close. There's seven minutes of added time because Jebison had gotten sent off on a kick out. There was lots of fucking hijinks going on. It was real stuff. And John Egan comes up with the scruffy goal at the end to break Wrexham hearts. Now, they did not lose. So this is where, oh, draws suck. This is a great draw because what it means for the FA Cup, if you don't know, uh, for the – until you get to the semifinal round, if you draw, you get a replay. And I don't know if anyone knows this. Historically with the FA Cup, they would play replays over and over again until someone won. So it was not unknown. There have been – I believe I'd have to look it up, but – there have been FA Cup runs where there are three, four replays or six back in the day. So if you play, if you if you had a draw, you did it again, and they'd find a place for it. They settled on having one replay. Uh, I'm sure there are lots and lots and lots of uh, Premier League managers who want no replays. <laughs> but uh, Wrexham will now go to um, to Hillsborough. I believe Sheffield United played Hillsborough. Is that right? Or is that Wednesday? I might have gotten it wrong. I don't think. Oh, Bramall Lane, excuse me. We'll go to Bramall Lane. Sheffield takes on Wrexham. We'll have to go there and play again. Wrexham are flying. I don't think that Sheffield will take this game lightly, but what an amazing game. What an amazing event that if you're not paying attention, February 7th, please find where you can watch Wrexham v. Sheffield. We'll all be rooting for Wrexham. And Mike knows, and he went nuts. The winner of this match does play Spurs. So Spurs will get either Wrexham or Sheffield. I'm sure Spurs wants Wrexham, or maybe they don't, or maybe they do. I think for the fame, for the faint of hearted, I'm sure they would want Wrexham more than anything in the whole world at this point. So we go to the next thing, and we have to talk about my friends, uh, my friends in Liverpool. Um, just, just having a hard time with uh, my other friends from, from Brighton. Again, unbelievable scenes. Brighton, about, about as obvious as you'd seem, is just unable. Liverpool is unable to defeat the mighty, mighty um, Brighton. Early in this game, so Konate and Goma is in the back. Early in the game, Ferguson misses one, passes it off to Marsh. Uh, from from Solly Marsh, Ferguson misses. Trent Alexander off the line, saves him. Then Salas breaks in down the line. A goal that he would have scored any time over the last five years, and he misses uh, in this case. And then they have another shot. Dunk, Lewis Dunk, a beloved Lewis Dunk. You want a real footballer? Lewis Dunk, captain, center back, number four for Brighton. This is a man's man. This is what Harry Maguire used to be but somehow got ruined and is not. When he was at Leicester, he used to play like this. But Lewis Dunk overplays Salah. Salah takes the ball, plays it on to Elliott. 
but continues its run. Uh, gets it back and then passes it into Elliott. One nil to Liverpool. So Liverpool looking good, feeling okay, but not really. They still can't control anything in the midfield. They can't control games at all. <laughs> and so the powerful midfield of Caicedo and um, and McAllister just running things. Liverpool dream of having a midfield that good. Uh, the second the, the the leveling goal comes from Lamptey deflected. In acres of space, this ball comes out to Lamptey. He's got a half an hour to hammer it. He does. Dunk, I think, intended to deflect this and deflects it home, uh, scoring the goal 1-1. Then the terrorist, that is Matomo, flies down the wing on an incredible pass and run onto Marsh. But Marsh misses. Again, Liverpool on the ropes, as usual, all over again. I don't know what to say anymore about Liverpool. They just, no matter what they do, this midfield was Basicic and Keita still overrun. Uh, Gapko, Gapko, uh, sorry, Cody Gapko, Gakpo, uh, has been able to, hasn't been able to affect games at all. Elliot has played well when he's there. And then Trent just getting abused by Matomo again. Uh, Robertson also not really affecting these games. And so, Matomo down the wing. He sets up another that almost happens. And then um, we get, so it's 1-1. Sorry. Then, the, sorry, we're still playing around, still playing. And in the end, it's an Estupian cross and a 90, Estupian cross in the 95th minute. And Matomo has no right to score this goal. He plays most of the game on the right, on the left side, comes over to the right side. He's on the back post. Three touches with his right foot. One to settle, one to Juke Gomez, who flies out of the screen. The Juke is so good, the cameraman's move off of Matomo, and then he slams it home. 95th minute winner, Matomo, again, terrorizing <laughs> poor Liverpool. And I don't think it's close. I don't think Liverpool fans feel like they lost this game. More possession to Brighton, took more shots, more on target, everything. In fact, Liverpool resorted to trying breaking players. So, uh, Fabinho tried to break Ferguson in half. Uh, really, really nasty fouls. That could have been Reds any other day. Liverpool are a shambles right now. Um, will they get better? Will they get there? I don't know what's happening to them. I don't know what they're going to do, how they're going to get there, how they're going to get better. There isn't a path forward at this point. So Liverpool's season now rests on, they're not going to win the league. They're out of the League Cup. They're out of the FA Cup. They're out of the league. And they have Real Madrid in the Champions League. Crazier things have happened, but Liverpool is really aiming for a lost season. And um, if I want to give a my diagnosis of Liverpool's problems are riding the same players for too long, having, trans- having a transfer policy that did not bring in high enough quality to challenge the players that were there. So it's good to have transfers, but they've got to push the guys they have. And then lastly, I don't think we can underestimate the 65 games that Liverpool played at the highest level of intensity and then just having it not go their way. Uh, Losing both the FA Cup. Sorry, did they win the FA Cup? Losing the, I don't know which one. Losing the league and the Champions League, right? They won the FA Cup and the League Cup. Uh, And just sort of limping out and going, man, we were almost there to being a legendary team. Um, I don't think the Mane thing is the end of the world. I think that Nunez has been good by and large. Um, I think it's more losing some of the continuity of Firmino, losing some of that connectivity, that connective tissue of how we play and who the leaders are. Um, The Sala thing, he's not having a great year, but... He really hasn't been good since he lost the CAF, since he lost the, the African Cup of Nations. And that's almost a year now. He was really on fire first three quarters of last season and came back from the Cup of Nations in the world and not making the World Cup. I, maybe it's the World Cup qualifier. I got it wrong um, last year. He really hasn't come back well since then. Uh, he's, a, he's a hot and cold player in some sense. He'll probably next season have 35 goals, but this season might be his 15-goal season. So Liverpool hurting, licking their wounds. Um, We spent a lot of the 
last session talking about Arsenal and Manchester City. We're now back at that game um, and going to sort of go through the first round of their heavyweight battles. So we set the stage, Arsenal, top of the league, City chasing them. Um, City actually in turmoil, um, losing Cancelo this week. So this was before that game. They just sent him off to Bayern, probably City's best attacking player over the last two, three seasons. He's gone. So the turmoil that I've been talking about with City where Pep losing his mind is not fake. There's something going on inside the team that just isn't quite the way we want it to be these days. So uh, City came into this game. This is the first of at least three more meetings, at least three meetings. So City in this game and City have two more games against Arsenal in the league at least. Uh, I don't think there's any other ways they can play. Uh, because City are not in the League Cup anymore. So this game was cagey. I thought Arsenal were really good. Uh, I think I talked about the five narratives that could happen. Um, and one of those was Arsenal play well but lose. And that sort of puts them still in the same position as Arsenal is good. They played well. They could have won this game. They did not play their best. And they sort of pushed the game along and go, okay, we're out of the FA Cup. Fine. You come and get us in the league. So they lose on a goal uh, created by Grealish on a shot by Julian Alvarez. Julian Alvarez at this point has to play. I think City are at their best when his energy is in the team. He is the most like-for-like player with your um, Jesus, Gabriel Jesus. He runs the channels. He's pressing. He drops deep. It all makes sense. So City are going with like a tall and short, a very traditional strike force partnership that came on in the second half with Alvarez and Holland together, where Holland simply stays in front occupying. And then we allow Alvarez to run deep. He's he's a bit of chaos, Alvarez. He'll shoot from far. Everyone with City is very measured and ordered, and it still doesn't look quite right. Uh, I will give credit to, to Jack Grealish. He's really been on form, but and Ketia had two really good chances that he could have scored. Um, one was blocked by Laporte. Uh, John Stones went out in this game, so City's a little bit hampered. And we saw some interesting um, tactics from Arsenal. They were playing City man for man. City didn't wasn't expecting it. Had to change at halftime. Um, Lewis um, came off, and so a little bit of things with City. City will take it. We'll move on. Take this FA Cup, feel good about it. But the Pep Arteta thing that I didn't quite talk about uh, as much in the buildup is something that's interesting. You know, what does it mean to have your understudy or your secondary coach? You know, he's known, Pep has known Arteta since he was 15 years old. Now it's kind of like we have the Zinchenko thing and we have the Jesus thing. And the two teams have older links, especially when Wenger was there. City would poach players from Arsenal, I think. Colo Torre and Samir Nasri, Gaio Clichy all became part of City's process of actually clawing Arsenal off their fourth place spot. And City became that fourth place spot. If you remember, I talked about when, when Newcastle were just coming up, they bought Chris Wood from Burnley to take Burnley out. So this is what City did to Arsenal. So uh, it's kind of an interesting thing there where City were so arrogant to send their own players to Arsenal to help out. I don't quite understand it. Pep's been weird. This is a weird season for City. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't win anything. Uh, it's very possible uh, that you get Holland, the best player in the league, and you're worse or you lose something. Uh, it's very hard to win three leagues in a row. I give a lot of respect to Sir Alex Ferguson for that. But City still playing a little funky. A little, a little funky and uh, a little less funky is our friend um mr hin min sun who leads the line for tottenham in their fa cup game moving them through to the next round against preston north end now i like saying preston north end they play at a stadium called deepdale i mean you couldn't freaking call this the hobbit anymore i mean it's just an incredible kind of name but preston north end have been having a good season 
as a defensive team. So I thought Spurs would have a harder time here, but it looked to me that um, Spurs had this one, and it was really good to see Sonny get really deep goals. I think maybe a little bit of a an opportunity for Son to not have to play off Kane and really feel be- feel feel good about taking shots and doing what he needed to do. Um, Spurs played Doherty and Sessegnon, and again. You know, they didn't have to defend. Uh, Spurs' weakness is defending. When they play on the front foot, they're good. And it makes you wonder, why doesn't Conte play on the front foot more often? He's so afraid of, um, of, of playing attacking football, he doesn't realize that that's his best path forward. There are good players in this Spurs side and Perisic playing at the nine, which is weird. He just played a sort of floating front three with Perisic, Kulishevsky, and Son, but Son being the primary shooter. We know that Perisic doesn't really like to shoot and he laid off uh, many shots. I don't have too much to talk about with our friends from Preston. Uh, They're in mid-table. They're a traditional team. Uh, They were the original Invincibles. I think in 1886, they went undefeated. (laughs) They were the first two league winners. Uh, I think in the actual football league before the offside rule. So Preston is an old school team famous for being the training ground for Mr. David Beckham. He started at Preston North End where uh, Sir Alex lent, loaned him and he had his first times at professional football playing a full season for Preston before coming to Miami United and becoming the handsome legend that he was with the famous goal against Wimbledon from the halfway line. Uh, but yeah, these teams have all this history. Uh, if we can go back to the Wrexham story, a team like Preston North End, you know, on, would be a team that you could probably buy, and they're inexpensive compared to American teams. Like they're like fifty million dollars. I mean, that's not nothing, but an MLS franchise is three hundred million dollars, if not more. So just not quite the same story as if you brought Preston North End and played at Deepdale Stadium. I mean, Deepdale, come on. It's fucking amazing. Turf Moor, Deepdale, you can't get better than these names. So uh, Spurs move on with a potential meeting up against the great and powerful Wrexham if they can handle their business against the mighty and powerful um, uh, Sheffield United. So we're praying for that. Uh, another game to talk about, just because we probably should, is um, Paul Lintz and his Reading hoops, his blue hoops, go to Man United. And they put up a fight, but ultimately lose to the more powerful team in United. This is a Casemiro game. He scored two really good goals, one from deep, one on a nice run, uh, and then um, a nice flick from Fred that came from Bruno that allowed United to get what they needed. So Paul Ince, if you don't know who Paul Ince is, he's one of the legends of of United's earliest incarnation when they first won the league from Liverpool with Cantona. He famously moved on to make room for uh, Nicky Butt and the class of 92. Paul Ince then went to Inter Milan. And then one of the reasons he's not lauded as one of the friends of Man United is that he went to Liverpool after he came back from Italy. Uh, Spending the rest of his career, you know, just plying his trade in the Premier League, playing till he's 38, going down levels. And he's really one of the only um, managers from the Sir Alex Ferguson tree still going. Um, I think, you know, I think of a lot of them, none of them have been really successful. I guess Steve Bruce is the most successful of the the Ferguson tree, really, uh, you know, who played under him and really was an old school football man, but Ince has been plying his trade. Never really too good, but still just grinding, being called the governor. Uh, that's his nickname. He's a London boy. Uh, play, coaching is his son, Tom. And he'll probably get fired from Reading eventually too, just like they all do. But he's a name. Uh, he's he's an interesting character. He's kind of got a Roy Keane fighting quality to him. Wants football played a certain way, a hard man, if you will. But um, United dispatch him no problem and United move on. So United are also in good shape for the FA Cup and uh let's go through the remaining results uh just to make sure that we've got everything clear. Um remaining results here. I'm going to just m- m- note the time 
so that I can you guys can pick it up later. Remaining results of the fourth round. There were a lot of draws, so there are going to be a lot of replays that go on. Like I said, City defeat Arsenal, not a problem. Our friends from Accrington and Stanley lose to the, our beloved Leeds. Uh, Patrick Banford helping a couple goals across the line um, there. Good stuff, very enjoyable stuff from Leeds who do pick up our friend Weston McKinney. We're going to talk transfers after we go through the rest of the scores. Um, Rovers, Blackburn Rovers, draw with Birmingham City. They'll have a replay. Fulham won. Sunderland won. That was a barn burner. Almost 35 shots in that game, but they'll have a replay in the northwest, northeast, in the northeast of Sunderland. Uh, Fulham have to travel a long way. My friends from Itwich Town, a level down, draw with Burnley. So Burnley don't score a goal. Lots of changes in that game. Uh, Vincent Company will take those boys back to Turf Moor and show them how it's done. Then Luton Town, two. Grimsby Town, two. Not much going on there. L Luton Town being the championship side, they would have expected to beat Grimsby, who are two levels down, but don't really get it done. Then the greatest team name in history, Sheffield Wednesday, one. The Owls drawing with Fleetwood Town, one, one. They get a replay. Our friends from uh, Southampton defeat Blackpool, two, one. So they move on, and Warsaw lose to our friends from Leicester. Kalechi Iheanacho, the most prolific goal scorer in the FA Cup still playing. He has 17 goals in 23 uh, FA Cup appearances. That's a lot. We love our nine and a half. He's a legend. Uh, Stoke defeats Stevenage 3-1. Stevenage were one of the lowest ranked teams left. And today, West Ham defeat Derby County with old boys Antonio and Bowen getting on the score sheet. Isn't that nice for the old boys? A couple of transfers we want to go to. I think I mentioned two on the spin as we were working through this. Um, Weston McKinney and Jao Cancelo, both moving on. But the big one still to come is the great and powerful Chelsea trying to put out a 105 million pound deal for Enzo Fernandez. He of the Argentine Championships World Cup winning team. A mad, mad bid. What craziness. Then, as I said before, Cancelo headed to Bayern for a 70 million pound buy option to buy. They don't have to buy, but they can buy. Arsenal's bid, 70 million for Caicedo, has been rejected. So Caicedo, one of the engine room players for Brighton, a great player. He really has gotten bad advice. He went on social media and wrote a nice letter to Brighton saying, oh, it's been great. I'm happy to move on uh, without the deal being done. And Brighton were like, not so fast, my friend. Brighton are holding firm and are going to keep Caicedo. They've sent him home until the window closes. And they're just like, you're not leaving. That 70 million is going to be there. So Arsenal really trying to go for the title, really getting that cover that they need in the midfield in case Shaka or Party to go down. I just realized Thomas Party is 29 years old and he's from Ghana. I'm not saying that African players lie about their age. I'm just saying African players play a lot and will do anything to get out of their country. I don't know how old he is. I'm just saying. It's a possibility he's a little older than uh, he says he is. And Spurs finally make their breakthrough on Pedro Porro and send uh, young heel and his hair to Sevilla. He's not, he's never gotten a shake with poor uh, Antonio Conte. Um, but Pedro Porro will come across, but um, the rest don't happen. And then Jed Spence, eh, he's not playing either. They're going to send Jed Spence to Rennes uh, in France. So... A lot of weird stuff going on with Spurs. That Levy thing where he does what he wants when Conte doesn't want it looks like the power struggles really going in Conte's favor when you see Heel move out and Spence move out while Poro's moving in. So interesting stuff there. Then another really weird transfer, and I would love to hear how what Arsenal fans think of this. Jorginho to Arsenal? That feels weird. There have been moves of players from Chelsea to Arsenal, most namely Peter Cech 
and Villian, but those were on freeze where the player was out of contract. I'm sure that Jorginho is, I'm sure that Chelsea would love to move Jorginho on and, you know, Chelsea might, uh, Arsenal might be a good spot for Jorginho, but that's a weird move. Uh, I understand the thinking on Jorginho for Arsenal in that he plays a real pass possession, boom, boom, boom kind of style, but he does not have the physicality to hang with what Thomas Partey does or Xhaka does. Uh, maybe athletically he's close to Xhaka. Maybe Arteta's thinking he can play in the Xhaka role, and if they need to, Xhaka will play deeper. I'm not sure how anyone would want Jorginho. He's such a, I don't have a better way to say this, limp player. A uh, couple other deals that have gone through that I think are more interesting. Anthony Gordon has left Everton and gone to Newcastle. So Anthony Gordon, one of the stars of the relegation battle, he and um, he and Richarlson really kept Everton up. Richarlson moved on. On, but he felt compelled to stay at Everton. It hasn't been the same for him, and he's just been like, I'm out. So Everton are going to try and take that money, and now the next rumor is that Everton would like to bring in Gallagher because he's not really fitting in with what's going on at Chelsea. I love Gallagher, but I don't think that he's a crisp enough passer of the ball. He relies very much on physicality and running and all action that suits lower level teams versus your possession precision passing. I think he's a bit too all over the place and not staying in position enough where Gallagher may have fun at Everton uh, if he moves further forward and he has a bit more freedom because he's a live wire and he'll score you goals by accident. Uh, I really like him. I could see him being a player who plays in clubs that are from 6 to 12 for the rest of his career without actually getting into that top-notch group because it's not really working for him as, at Chelsea as much as he would like it to work at Chelsea. So there's that. Do you want to touch on the rest of the round? Um, because we have some interesting matchups. Let me just make sure I get my draw right, because on Google, they don't really quite have it accurate because you can't see uh where the information is because it it's uh it's dependent on whether all the how all these draws go so this is for march 28th oh sorry february 28th through march 2nd here are the matchups southampton will get luton the winner of luton versus grimsby leicester city will face blackburn or birmingham Stoke City gets Brighton. Brighton, really good chance here to um, to win a trophy if they can keep moving. As, as noted, Wrexham or Sheffield face Tottenham. Fulham or Sutherland get Leeds. Fulham, Fulham versus Leeds is like an Americans, uh, Americans past versus Americans future. Uh, Bristol City versus Manchester City. City get a good draw. I'm sure someone's complaining. United will go. Sorry. United will host West Ham, and then Ipswich or Burnley will play Sheffield Wednesday or Fleetwood, which is crazy. Uh, I didn't mention one um, one item that I did want to cover. Weston McKinney has signed for Leeds. So Tyler Adams, Aronson, and McKinney all at Leeds now. So the United States of Leeds has really, really picked up. So we are now much more connected to that group of Americans. are all playing for Jesse Marsh. American coach, American engine room, American number 10. I think that with Somerville and Yonto, uh, Leeds should be a really good time and really worth seeing. I don't have anything else. I love you all equally but different. Show your stickers, share them around the world, and I will leave you with... That was the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast with Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports Channel and presented exclusively by the Premier Streaming Network. We record on Mondays and Thursdays, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.